Hello and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Does Logic with a piano lesson in the background, hopefully not too distracting. We are ready to talk about the semantics of predicate logic. This is going to involve a number of videos covering definitions, but they're all going to be fairly short and fairly sweet. In this one, I'm going to give you the definition of a model. Everything in, predic in a predicate language is always going to be evaluated as true or false with respect to a particular model. Now, this model is going to involve a bunch of things that we've seen before. It's going to have this notion of interpretation in this sort of set theoretic uh, manner that we had in the interpretation for categorical propositions. It's also going to have a concept of truth, which will allow us to evaluate the truth of uh, the propositional connectives in the same way that we did with propositional logic. So this really is kind of a melding of categorical logic and propositional logic, but with extra things so that we can say even more. So the definition of a model is quite straightforward and comes in two parts. Let's bring up our screen so that we can get it all written down nice and explicitly. So definition, and this is a predicate logic model or a quantified model or a quantification model, you'll find a number of different ways that, uh, that this notion is expressed. But a quantified model, M, is a pair, it's two objects, sorry, D and I, where, you have to say what each of these things is. D is a non-empty set of objects. So I will say a little bit more about the non-empty part, but right now the, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about why non-empty, but uh, first I wanna say something about this set of objects. So what the objects are is not specified. They can be things, they can be shapes, they can be cats. So as we saw in the previous video where there's kind of this implicit restriction to just shapes that I had written on the whiteboard, the, these implicit restrictions come from the nature of the domain. So this is uh, called the domain or sometimes called the domain of discourse because maybe you're kind of restricting your consideration not just to everything but to some subset. It's also sometimes called the universe or the universe of discourse. All of these are the same thing, but all that it is, it's a set and it has things in it. And these things will have different properties. Now, the non-empty part is important. There has to be at least one object in the set. And that is because without having any objects, a lot of our truth conditions stop making sense. The definitions that I'm going to be giving in the next couple of videos are only sensible definitions if we are talking of at least one object. But it's important to notice that we are making this assumption because this is not a neutral assumption. It's the one metaphysical assumption that classical logic makes. And that is the assumption that there is at least one object that we are talking about. So nothing more than that. We could have exactly one object, but just as we always had non-empty interpretations of categorical terms, we also will always have non-empty domains of discourse. And this comes with it as a consequence that the statement, there is something that is self-identical will turn out to be a tautology. If you don't like this, then you have a complaint about classical semantics for predicate logic, and you probably want to be off doing the non-classical logics in any case, but get your classical foundation first, and then we can tweak things and play with things from there. So that is my little metaphysical digression on domains. The more interesting part of the model, of course, are the interpretations. So I is going to function, is an interpretation that functions very much like it does in the categorical setting. So it is an interpretation function such that, So we need to say what it does for each bit in the language. For every constant symbol C, the interpretation of C is some object in the domain. 
for every n place function symbol f, the interpretation of that function is, oops, I'm going to have to erase, erase my tautology. Uh, the interpretation of a function symbol fn is an n airy function on the domain. And for every n place predicate symbol, so this covers both the unary predicates and the relations of, you know, of greater arity, the interpretation of that symbol is going to be a subset of the relevant combination of a, a, the, the relevant collection of objects from the domain. So this is how it's written in the set theoretic notation, but the way that you can read this is that um, the interpretation of some n area relation is a set of n tuples of the domain. And these are the ones that the relation R applies to. So n, n tuple is a very nice logic -y word. You might know of like doubles, triples, quadruples, quintuples, sextuples, septuples, octuples, etc. N tuple is just the generalization of that. Now, there isn't a word for like a one tuple but that is just individual objects. So if you have a predicate, the interpretation of the predicate is the set of objects that that predicate applies to. If you have a binary relation, the interpretation of that binary relation is the set of pairs that that relation applies to. If you have a, bi a ternary relation, it is the set of triples. If you have a quaternary relation, it is the set of quadruples and so on and so forth. Once we give examples of this, it will become much clearer. But there is our domain. It is a set of objects and a thing that tells us what bits in our language pick out what bits of the domain. And there you have it. You even got a bonus cat. Aren't you lucky? Next time, we will talk about what to do with the variables. We will have a notion of variable assignments and X variants of assignments and things like that. And this is what we will need in order to be able to make sense of the truth conditions for the quantifiers. So join me then for fun with variables. Take care. See you then. Cheers.